coming up. So, Miss Megan, would you come on up and with your helpers? Hillside, we have a few minutes where our children's ministry is going to um, tell us what the Lord's doing in the lives of our kids. Would you welcome them as they come? Yeah. <laughs> Good morning. So this summer we're going over the fruits of the spirit. We've gone over which one so far, Jaden? Give me one. Um, I forget them. Love, joy, and then peace. Yes. Yeah, love, joy, and peace. This week it's. Do you know joy? No, Jaden. Do you know what we're doing this week? Yep. Patience. Yes, patience, which I think is a very good one to go over, right? Yeah. So turtles. You guys know what a turtle looks like. They're famous for being slow. If you had to wait for a turtle on a walk as you're going and you can't get around him and you have to stay right behind him, you'd need a lot of patience. So we can all get impatient sometimes. It's hard to wait for people and it's hard to wait for things to happen. Sometimes people do things that bother us and it's easy to get grouchy with other people when we feel impatient. But God wants us to treat others well, even when things bug us. So that is why we need patience. Let's pray. Dear God, we just thank you so much for being patient with us. Sometimes we get impatient with other people. We get mad when people don't do things our way or if they're not fast enough. But we just ask that you please help us learn how to be patient. In Jesus' name, amen. So. It's easy to feel impatient when things don't go your way, right? Yeah. Sometimes people just do things that make it harder for us to be patient or get what we want. So when we're impatient, we're tempted to say some not so nice things, right, Jaden? Yeah. How about you, Joy? Do you say some not so nice things when you're impatient? Yes. Yeah, I think I do too. So today we're gonna learn about patience, like we said, and we're going to explore why we should be patient the same way that God is patient with us. So our Bible story is in Matthew 18. I'm sure you guys have heard it. This is a different take on it and how I've learned it before. So it's about the unmerciful servant. People used to weigh out gold when in Bible times, and so our story, we have a lot of money. This is our gold for our story today. Jesus was talking, and one day Peter goes, how many times do I need to show patience and forgive people? And God was like, or Jesus was like, all right, well, I'm going to answer that question with a story. So Peter asked, is seven times enough? Is seven enough for me to be patient with someone and forgive them? Well, Jaden, you were telling us an interesting story this morning about when someone does something rotten to you over and over again. Like, how does that feel? Um, not very good. Joy, how would you feel about somebody that, let's say, took your Lego building apart after you worked so hard on it? How would you feel? (laughs) Terrible. Terrible. How would you feel about that person, Joy? I would be so mad at him. (laughs) Mad, yeah. I don't have Legos myself, but I would be pretty mad, too, if my sister took the book that I was reading, that I was really, really into. So... Is it hard or easy to be patient with someone who keeps taking your Legos from the building you took all day to build to use for their teeny tiny rocket project? It is very, very mean and hard to be patient with them. Joy, I'm sure you're more patient than Jaden. Is it easy to be patient with someone that keeps taking your Legos? No. No, okay, so you're both, so you both feel a little impatient with somebody. Well, what would showing patience to them be like? Jaden, how would you show patience if someone kept taking your Legos? Just say, you know what? Don't worry about it. You can have them for your little tiny transformer. Okay. (laughs) Kind of feels like you're not being too patient there. Joy, how would you show patience to someone if they kept taking your Legos? Take whatever ones you want that I say. <laughs> oh, so you would, you would say, here's your pile, here's my pile. Oh, it could be a compromise. Well, Jesus told Peter that he needed to show patience seven times 70. So, Jaden, our mathematician, how many times is that? That would be 490 times. So, Peter's going, all right, I'm going to make a list of how many people I need to forgive and how many times I have to forgive them. 
Jesus is like, no, 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 we're going to tell a little story about that and figure out how we're supposed to do this. So one day there was a king, and the king was looking over his money books, and he realized his servant owed him 10,000 talents of gold. So 10,000 talents of gold would be worth a million dollars. So here's our really heavy bucket, and if I had given Joy just a light cloth, our scales would show gold is pretty heavy, cloth not so much. So what would you do with all that money if I loaned you 10,000 talents of gold? I have no idea. No idea, Joy. If I lend you 10,000 talents of gold, what would you do with it? Uh, probably buy pets. Okay. <laughs> or maybe more Legos. Buy more Legos. Well, it would take you a long time to earn all that money back to pay the person, right? Well, the servant came in and he didn't have enough money. He has spent all the gold, he was out of luck. The king ordered the servant and his whole family be sold into slavery. So Jaden, let's say you're the servant that owed me money. Well, you're gonna be sold into slavery and your family's gonna be sold into slavery and all your Legos and all your house and belongings are gonna be sold to pay back this debt. What would you do? Adios! No, 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 no. You still have to pay this debt. So how would you feel, Joy, if you had to pay this debt? And I was saying, nope, you can't do anything about it but pay me back. I don't even have any money. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe you guys would start begging. Be like, please, please, let us ha have mercy on us. Well, that's what the servant did. He started to beg, and the king felt sorry for him, so he forgave him the money and said, you know what? Forget it. Your debt's paid. You're good. So then the second servant, or the first servant went off and found the second servant who owed him just a little bit of money. And it was about maybe three months worth of pay that he had to work for. But the first servant, he forgot something. The first servant had just been forgiven of a really big debt. What would you have done to the second servant if the servant owed you money, Jaden? I would have said, I learned something from that king. I could have been a slave right now. So just don't, just don't worry about it. You, got, you can have all that money I loaned you. So he would have, you would have been forgiving of the debt. Or, Joy, you could be patient and say, you know what? You have three months to pay me back, right? You could be patient. Well, the servant wasn't as wise as Joy or Jaden. And he said, you owe me the money. Pay it up now or I'm going to throw you in jail. Not a very good option. So the second servant, he's begging the first servant to be patient with him, give him a little bit more time. And he said, no, I'm going to throw you in jail. And the king found out he wasn't too happy. He was, I guess you could say, furious. Yeah. yeah he threw the first servant in jail until he could repay in full. So what was so surprising about the way the first servant treated the second servant, Joy? Well, he wasn't very nice. He wasn't very nice? After he had been forgiven. Yeah, after he'd been forgiven. So, do you think the king's reaction was fair, Jaden? Um, in ways, yes, and in ways, no. Um, it was probably fair to the second servant to say, hey, you, you did that to me, then you get the same thing done to you. And, but for the first servant, not very, he probably didn't think it was that fair because, hey, you forgave me, you're not supposed to do that. Mm, so the king wasn't too happy with the first servant because he forgot his lesson. So, Joy, how was the king like God in our story? He forgives. He forgives. But how is the king different from God, Jaden? He got really furious really fast and Loot lost his patience with the first servant. True. The, the king is like God in that he forgave, but he's different from God in that he took away his forgiveness from the first servant. God doesn't take away his forgiveness. Once he's forgiven, he's forgiven. And so we don't have to worry about the king becoming um, angry at us when we do something wrong and saying, nope, I'm not forgiving you this time. I have it written down. You've done it too many times. I'm not forgiving you. That's just the opposite of what Jesus was telling Peter. He said you are to be patient and to forgive no matter how many times. So instead of writing down, okay, well, Jaden took my Legos today, I forgave him. Jaden took my Legos today, I forgave him. He took them yesterday, I forgave them. Well, he's got, I don't know, maybe 
three, 487 more times for me to forgive him. No, we're not supposed to keep track of that. God shows us that he can be patient every day, and so we can be patient with him, with one another, just like he is patient with us. He's patient when we sin. He's patient when we're slow to do something. That is what he's asked us to do. All these things add up every day, making us like that first servant who owed God more money than he could ever repay. So God expects us to imitate his patience by forgiving others when they do bad things to us and by being kind when others make us wait. We should be patient with others in the same way that God is patient with us. So let's just pray. Lord, we thank you so much for being patient with us, and we ask that you continue to remind us that we have patience with others as you have shown us to be patient, and that you are always forgiving us. We thank you, God, for that, because we are like the unmerciful servant and how we have so many debts that we could never repay you, but you've forgiven them all. So we just thank you for that, Lord. We just ask that you help us to continue to be patient with one another, and we just give this morning back to you. Amen. Awesome. Thank you, Children's Ministry team. Good job. Good morning again, Hillside. It's good to see you. Thank you for joining us here in the room. Thank you for joining online. If the worship team can join me up front on the platform, that would be great. We're going to worship in a moment. Um, friends, if you are online, would you mind to grab some, some communion elements, a piece of bread and some juice? We're going to share in the Lord's Supper together. And if you're here in the room and you didn't get a chance to get communion on the way in, there's some out in the lobby, and then there's also some up here. We're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper together in a little bit as part of our worship service. We have our friends John and Carrie Shuey with us this morning. We're so excited for their ministry. And Carrie uh, shared that there was a psalm on her heart for this morning. And I, I asked her if she'd read it because I believe it's the posture of some of us. And it takes us from where we are to looking at where the Lord wants us to be. So, Carrie, would you come up and read this? Just, this is my friend Carrie Shuey. Everyone say hi, Carrie. If you're online, type in the chat, hi, Carrie, and it's spelled K-E-R-R-Y. Yeah, so here, would you read God's word to us? Thank you. Thank you, James. Thank you. Good morning, Hillside Church. Um, I, I said to the prayer group this morning that as I read this this morning, I felt like it was more than just for me. It's for some here, or maybe all of us, and it's definitely... Um, it definitely goes along with even the children's sermon because it shows a side of David where he was getting impatient. And we all, get, we all are there sometimes, and sometimes we're there even now with this whole virus business and this whole situation. So let me read Psalm 113 to you. This is where David says, "'How long, Lord, will you forget me forever?' How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and day after day have sorrow in my heart? How long will my enemy triumph over me? Look on me and answer, Lord, my God. Give light to my eyes or I will sleep in death. And my enemy will say, I have overcome him and my foes will rejoice when I fall. But, and this is the good news, he came to this place where God wants all of us to come to. We can struggle, we can struggle, we can argue, we can even voice those complaints to God. God can handle that. But he said, in the last two verses, he said, that I will trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing the Lord's praise, for he has been good to me. Amen. He's good to us. And sometimes that's all we can say. Lord, you're good. You're good. The situation isn't necessarily good, but you're good. And I refuse to let the enemy drag me down and say you're not good. He's good. God is so amazing because um, uh, the Lord uh, laid it on Ron's heart actually this week to sing songs about the Lord's goodness. And I just felt um, as we were practicing just what medicine it is to our soul to just say, you're good, Lord, you're good. Just to rehearse that even when we're not necessarily feeling that in our emotions because um, it's true. He is 
is good. He is good. The circumstances around us, like um, Kerry just said, might not be good, but He is good. Amen. So we're gonna we're gonna praise and worship. You know, we want to be a people that can sing and worship and live before the Lord um, triumphantly, even before we see the other side of the storm, even before we see the answers to our prayer. Because you know, we thank God for what He does, but. Our faith doesn't grow too much if we wait until we get the answer and then we say thank you. But in the midst, um, can we stand together this morning and just from your heart, just offer up a, a prayer, a thank you to the Lord. You know, there's always something to thank him for, even in the midst of um, great difficulty. Thank you for the cross, Jesus. Thank you for making a way of salvation. Thank you that the grave couldn't hold you, but you rose again. And you offer us resurrection even in our own hearts and in our own lives. And Lord, we pray your great grace. We pray deliverance for the world, deliverance for the country, deliverance for the from um, just the, the, the own things that we have in our heart that we might feel trapped by. We thank you for freedom. And we declare together today that you are good. You are good. We're going to praise you. And, and your, the praises of you will be found on our lips and our hearts. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. You guys ready to praise and worship?
wanna scream it out from every mountain top. Your goodness knows no bounds. Your goodness never stops. Your mercy follows me. Your kindness fills my life. Your love amazes me. And I sing because you are good And I dance because you are good And I shout because you are good You are good, good to me Nothing and no one comes anywhere close to you. The earth and oceans deep only reflect this truth. That in my darkest night, you shine as bright as day. Your love amazes me. And I sing because you are good And I dance because you are good And I shout because you are good You are good to me And I sing because you are good And I dance because you are good And I shout because you are good You are good, good to me With a cry of praise, with a cry of praise, my heart will proclaim, you are good, you are good, in the sun or rain, my life celebrates, you are good, you are good. With a cry of praise, my heart will proclaim, you are good, you are good. In the sun or rain, my life celebrates, you are good, you are good. And I sing. Because you are good and I dance because you are good and I shout because you are good you are good to me and I sing and I sing because you are good and I dance because you are good and I shout because you are good you are good you good to me
sing, He answers prayers. And He answers prayers. And He answers prayers. You're so good. God, you're so good. God, you're so good. God, you're so good. You're so good to me. God, you're so good.
friends, I was thinking about our time together this morning and the state of the world and the kingdom of God, and my heart was burdened for us to share communion together this morning. So if you'll take out your communion cup, I want to walk us through this. And again, if you're here in the room and you don't have one, there's some up here. You can feel free to get one there. I was reflecting that in, in this moment, the body of Christ has become so divided. And I believe that's the plan of Satan to divide the body of Christ. His plan is always to steal, kill, and destroy. And God has a plan for unity. And in communion, I'm reminded that we are united as the body of Christ. This is the thing that has united the body of Christ for thousands of years. No matter whatever their background is, whatever their, wherever they are in the world, whether it's in Asia or Africa or Europe or here in America, this body of Christ that we celebrate in communion is the thing that unites us. And I feel in this moment so much that the Lord is calling us to be united uh, about the presence of Jesus, about the presence of Jesus. This is the verse that, that stuck out to me. This is from 1 Corinthians. At the end of what Paul talks about communion, he says, whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And in taking communion that we're going to do in a minute, we are proclaiming that the Lord died for us. And what does that mean? It means that the powers of this world are defeated. It means that the, the powers that, that try to wage war are defeated and that the kingdom of God is come and is still coming, that the reign of Jesus is here. That's what we celebrate when we celebrate communion. We celebrate that Jesus is ruling and reigning throughout the earth. Isn't that so good? We are proclaiming to the world that Jesus is king. So in that atmosphere, with this expectation, that Jesus is ruling and reigning in our hearts. He's coming and ruling and reigning in the world. I want you to, to take the, the bread, this wafer. Here's what Paul said. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And we take the bread, and Jesus, we thank you that your body was broken for us so that we could become whole. Lord, thank you that you suffered on the cross, that you died so that we, in your brokenness, Jesus, we receive your wholeness. We receive your wholeness as we celebrate and we take this bread today. And Paul said, this cup is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink in remembrance of me. And so we take the cup, the cup and we drink it in remembrance that Jesus' life flows through us. So Jesus, thank you for spilling your blood so that we can have your blood in us, Jesus, that we can have life. We can have eternal life now and forever. Jesus, we thank you for the life that came that we have from you spilling your blood for us. Jesus, thank you that you are ruling and reigning. We recognize your presence here. We recognize that this is not just an act, but it's a way of proclaiming that your goodness and your kingdom is here. And we celebrate your goodness today, Jesus. No matter what circumstances are going on, you rule, you reign. There is no question of that, Jesus. And we celebrate your ruling and reigning today, God.
just a blanket of peace would rest in this place and on your people's hearts. Thank you for your great peace. You've got this.
Father, we thank you for your goodness. Lord, we thank you that you are good. You are the definition of good. Lord, that no matter what's going on, you are good. And God, we thank you that, the, that you give good gifts. Lord, thank you for the gifts of your spirit, Lord, that come to give us power to be witnesses for you, Jesus. Lord, thank you for the gift of liberty that we have in this country to be able to proclaim you without worry or fear of getting in trouble, Jesus. Thank you for the freedom that we have, Jesus. Lord, thank you for the ability to pray for our leaders. Lord, we pray that you would give our leaders in this nation and in our state wisdom right now, Jesus. I pray that their hearts would turn to you. Lord, one day they're going to have to answer for this moment. And Lord, I pray that they'd be crying out to the God of heaven for wisdom, God. Lord, would you pour out your wisdom on them? Lord, and, and we pray that you, that you would bless them, God. Would you bless our governmental leaders, Jesus? Would you bless our president and protect our president? Lord, would you bless and protect our governor? Jesus, we ask that you would move in our nation so that we can continue to worship with freedom and liberty, Jesus. Thank you that where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. There is liberty. Lord, thank you for this freedom that we have. We don't take it for granted. We celebrate it today, Jesus. Thank you for this freedom that we have in you. Thank you for setting us free from sin. Thank you for setting us free from, from the weight of sin, Lord. Lord, you've completely freed us. May we walk in that freedom and, and look at others around us and pray and intercede and speak so that they can be free too, Jesus. May we be a freed people that goes around to see the works of the enemy destroyed and other people freed and coming into the kingdom of God. Thank you for your freedom and your liberty this morning, Jesus. Amen. 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 It's so good to be with you during this 4th of July weekend. Feel free to have a seat if you haven't already. Thank you, worship team. So good to be together for a time of worship got a couple of announcements for you. And by the way, I know some are wondering, some have written on Facebook, we are honoring the governor's request. Um, and we're having conversations at the door with people about masks, just in case you're wondering, we are submitting to our governmental authorities and we are praying for God's wisdom for them. A couple other announcements for you. Want to let you know, if you don't know, our senior pastor, uh, Pastor Steve Blair is on sabbatical and he and his family, they were out in the West, out in the Midwest and West, and they are back here in Pennsylvania. So you might see them around, you might see them at the grocery store and they don't want you to be weird about it. So if you see them, say hi to them. Uh, they're on sabbatical as far as ministry here, but they, they miss friendship. So if you see them, please say hi and welcome them and greet them. They would love that. So just want to give you a heads up about that. And today... Nathan, wave your hand, Nathan, as you take a picture. Today is Nathan's birthday. Nathan is interning with us. Today's his 25th birthday. Hold still. I want to pray for you. If you'll extend your hand to Nathan with me, I just want to pray. Jesus, thank you for Nathan and the gift that he is to our church. Thank you for the gifts of creativity and the gift of communication you've given him. Lord, we celebrate this 25th birthday with him. God, I pray that you would pour out your spirit on him. I pray that he would know the divine purpose that he has this year. God, I pray that he would see the gift that he is to the body of Christ. Jesus, we pray that you would bless him abundantly this year. Amen. Love you, buddy. All right, a couple other announcements. We have our food bank that's happening tomorrow. It's happening every Monday in the month of July. And I just want to tell you one quick story. I don't know all the details. Brian Diffenderfer does. But here's just an example from what happens. Last week we served, I believe it was 222 families that came through the food bank. 222 families. That's a lot of people. That's a lot of food, isn't it, Craig? It was a lot, a lot that came off the truck. And here's just one story. Brian Diffenderfer prayed with someone last two weeks ago, and he felt like the Lord was speaking about relationships. And so he prayed for them and just, and just shared, like, I believe that God wants to bless relationships in your life. And the person came back this past week, and they said, I got to tell you, God did a work in between my son and someone he was estranged with. And they were before, they weren't together, they weren't even talking, and God has restored that relationship. 
That's one story from one of these 222 families. So thank you for your partnership. And we're always looking for help. There's so many ways you can help. If you're strong, like James 2.0 back there, you can, and you can lift 30 to 40 pound boxes. We need your help. If you can talk with people and pray with them, we need your help. If you can answer the phone so that Amber is not 18 places at once, we can use your help. There's lots of different ways you can use, we can use your help. So if you're interested in helping out, please see Amber. Amber, wave your hand. If you're on, there's Amber there. If you're on Facebook, write down, Amber, I want to help, and she will contact you. So that's our food bank. Please spread the word. I'm amazed. Craig can attest to this. There's new people every week that come to the food bank. They're coming from all over the area. Um, And just so you know, you're going to see a rebroadcast. If you're on Facebook tomorrow at 11, you're going to see this service go back online. We're going to be sharing it for the people that are in the parking lot. Uh, We're hoping that they will connect to what the Lord's doing here. So you'll see this go back live. We are not testing things out in the sanctuary like sometimes happens, right, Todd? It's a planned rebroadcast, just so you know. We're praying that God would bless that and draw people to him through that. Uh, two more things. One more thing. Just want to thank you for giving during this time. You can give if you're here in the room. There's a basket on your way out. You can give in. If you're online, you can give. Um, well, either way, here or online, you can give through our website, hillsidechristian.org. You can text to give any amount to 84321. And you can also mail checks into our address that's on the screen. And I'm going to ask my friend Todd Gearhart to come. He's going to introduce our speakers this morning. Would you say good morning, Todd? Good morning. Wow. Um, so I get to welcome uh, Pastor John and Carrie Shuey today. Um, not, maybe uh, you guys have, have not known, but they, uh, at a time, our church really needed uh, pastors. They came and interim pastored here, interim pastored here uh, many years ago. And I was reflecting upon that time, and I really thought, wow, what they did at that point was uh, came into our church and really fathered and mothered us. They, they became spiritual parents to our, our congregation when we needed it most. And, you know, what? Um, over the years that I've known them since then, I realized that that's a consistent theme that they have. They are constantly parenting. They, they uh, are missionaries, and they uh, travel um, all, all around the world. And uh, But wherever they're at, they're ministering. They're fathering and mothering. Wherever they're at, I know recently they just... Uh, um, Skyped at midnight, I believe in India. And you're probably going to share a story about that, I'm sure, but uh, perhaps. But they are uh, choosing to use technology and, and uh, parenting however God has them to do. So um, can we welcome these guys as parents today? Not just as pastors, it's good, but as a parent, as a father and a mother in the house. Um, so kind of incline your ear. I know that's an archaic phrase, but you know, that just means to, to lean in. You know, there's like um, there's a body language thing we do when someone uh, is like leaning towards you. It kind of means that they're actually really paying attention to what you're, what you're saying. So if we can like reflect that not only in our body language, but in our heart language towards them to really lean into what God is saying through John and Carrie this morning. So can you guys join me in welcoming them this morning as they come? I think Carrie's going to share first, right? Yeah. Come on up. Constantly, as we sang, taking us deeper, deeper still. And it's often through the hard things, the trials that take us deeper. So we want to give you a little update. Yeah, okay. Is it here? So we're going to give you a little update on uh, what we've been up to since we last saw you. I don't know if the PowerPoint's there, but... We are from uh, Kingdom Quest Ministries. That's a title the Lord gave us many years ago. Uh, as Todd said, we're kind of a, uh, we're a mom and a pop. <laughs> Our ministry is sort of a mom and pop faith ministry. Uh, it's just us and those that we've included. We have a board 
we um, we go out as the Lord leads. We don't kick down doors. We wait for the Lord to open the doors. We get invitations places, but we pray about every invitation. And we pray in the finances because the Lord has called us not to be fundraisers, but to just ask him and talk to him and share what he's doing. So we're thankful that Hillside has uh, uh, heard God's call to partner with us. We, we really appreciate what you guys have done in the way of giving and in the way of prayer. We need your prayers. We would be fools to do what we do if we did not have prayer. Um, he's taken us to like 24 nations. One of them, Liberia. Yay, Michael. It's so good to see Michael again. And uh, he's taken us all these different places. He's connected us with people that we would never have met. So as our brother prayed, Steve, this morning, thank you, Lord, for the big, big family that you've given us, the family of God. The family of God has become more precious to us through the years than ever. So um, I, we're going to give you a little update. And w first, I'll, uh, I guess I was supposed to share some of the things I've been up to. While we've been home, uh, as we are, we're supposed to be back in Africa, Cote d'Ivoire, Ivory Coast, in May, of course, COVID changed everything, right? And so we uh, postponed that trip. We will be going. Uh, no, nope, I don't want that yet. We will be going to um, Lord Willing. We're planning to go back next May, and we'll be doing two weeks of uh, two years of teaching in two weeks. So we will really need your prayers next May, <laughs> and uh, it'll be many hours. Those precious, precious people, those students, sit there in the heat for hour after hour, take notes, listen, and we we um. We will be going, Lord willing, then. So while we've been here, uh, we've been, my, my role has been a lot of communication, counseling, mentoring, and the Lord has reconnected us. Michael, do you recognize Pammy and Abby? Those two girls, they were worship leaders when I was in Liberia. He's reconnected us, and they, they call me mommy, mom, mother. Uh, the girl on your left is Rosaline, and she's a daughter from Pakistan. <clears throat> and we met her our first trip in Pakistan, or was it the second? Yeah, he's going to tell her story. <laughs> but I love this girl, and she has an amazing story, which she will tell you. Um, and we talk on the phone, and we email, text, WhatsApp, all that stuff. So the Lord's given us uh, kids around the world, which we love, and now grandkids. So um, John has been doing a lot of preaching in spite of this. He did a parking lot. That's a parking lot service there. And these are some of the places he has preached and is going to, and there's Hillside on there. So we, uh, we love and welcome every opportunity to share the word of God because the word of God, there, there's a dearth in the land. And there's, there's an absence, even in many parts of the body of Christ, in knowing the word of God. People have diminished the importance of the word of God. And so it is our sword, people. It is our sword. And as James said earlier, the thief, the enemy, Satan comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but we will defeat him by the word of God, the word of our testimony, the blood of the lamb, and it was just as Jesus used the sword of the spirit in the wilderness. That's the only thing Satan needs to listen to. We can say, bug off, get away, but when we use the word of God, he must flee. So, um, John has used this time to write another book. And uh, he it's a book that will be coming, uh, hopefully. <laughs> We've submitted it to a friend of ours who's publishing. It's going to be called Finishing Well. And 
Oh, finishing strong. Sorry, finishing strong. And I, I've helped edit it, but it'll have to go through more editing. And all the books that we've done with the Breaking Free, the uh, Becoming You, the um, Help Me, Help Me, Fully Alive, and now uh, Finishing Strong, is the this book is has a lot to do with suffering and how we persevere, how we push through in difficult times. So it's going to be a timely book for the body of Christ, I believe. And we're praying, please pray, that if God wants it published, it will be. We're not about, you know, having names or money, but we want it to be used. And everything that we've made from the books that we have have gone back into ministry. So, um and these are just some coming things, uh, some women's conferences. And we are kind of excited or have a strong sense uh, of the fact that we are to do a conference in October. And if you, it's October 24th in Harrisburg. It's scheduled. We'll, we'll be telling you more about it. But it's to help alienated parents and grandparents. We are learning more and more about this. We are learning that there are so many in our day who have uh, pushed their parents away and forbidden the parents from being with the grandkids. And it's, a, it's been called the hidden epidemic. And it's every week we're meeting or hearing of people who are in this boat. There, we've learned that there is uh, one out of ten mothers in this country, and it may even be more now, who have a, at least one adult child who is not talking to them, and even withholding the grandchildren. And in Great Britain, it's one out of five. But we've been reading, studying, praying about this, and learning some things that we believe the Lord wants us to share that will be helpful because it is a situation that brings anguish to the hearts of people. And I've had uh, many women, I've met with many women crying, and it's, it's a heartbreak that's undescribable. So that is October 24th in, it'll be at uh, New Love in Christ in Harrisburg. If you know of anyone, or you, there may be some in the room here who are in that situation, um, please Take note of that or write it down because it is uh, something we feel the Lord wants us to do. So, oh, I better go back. Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, I would value your prayers because I'm doing uh, three-part women's meetings in Mumbai, India via Skype. We are thankful for people like Todd, who is our helpful, techie, wonderful guy, because we are so untechnological. And, um, but we're, we're going to do it by Skype. And we did it. John preached. Is that, did I have a picture of that? Uh, okay. He, d he preached at midnight, 1230. And it, made, it was like 530 their time, 930. So this one is at 730 a.m., I'm praying I can be wide awake enough for these women. Three, it'll be July 8th, 9th, and 10th. And uh, I, I love these women. Some of them I don't know, some I do know, but it'll be a three-part women's uh, meetings. And I'm praying that the Lord gives me, he hasn't given me the exact uh, messages, but I, I know he will. So that's this week. So thank you for your prayers, your love. We love you guys. <clears throat> we look forward to, um, we, we, we come here, and each time we come, we see new faces, different faces, old faces, I mean, former faces that we knew, <laughs> old faces. We've each uh, passed, uh, in April, I hit the 70 mark, and I said, Lord, this is older than dirt. I never thought I'd be this age. But the Lord gives us strength. He gives us uh, energy. He's given us health to take his message to the nation. So we thank you so much. We thank those of you guys who pray for us and are involved with us. And uh, we love you. And 
I'm going to turn it over to my husband who will bring the word to you today. God bless you. Everybody else is in business, and uh, so it's almost amazing I could tell that was actually Hannah back there. You can't identify anybody anymore. Um, what a time period we're in. You know, when I go out in the morning, my wife always asks me if I have my phone because I have a tendency to leave my phone at home. Now I do you have your phone? Do you have your mask? Because you never know whether you're going to be someplace where you need a mask. <clears throat> the other day, I, was, I had an early morning meeting, and we walked a little bit later, and we decided we would go to the mall and walk. We decided that it's much better to walk outside when it's 85 degrees with the mask off than to walk in the mall in the air conditioning with the mask on. We got so hot, it was just kind of an amazing thing. But what a time period we're in. Who would have ever thought in the middle of February or middle of, especially February, but even the middle of March, that we would be where we are right now. Uh, businesses shut down, people with small businesses wondering whether they're going to be able to reopen, people wondering whether their jobs are going to be there. Uh, just an amazing thing, an uptick, and people are doing various things with, uh, with businesses and, and all of that all over the world. And then we had the tragic death of uh, George Floyd a while back and, and hundreds of people, thousands around the world protesting and others that took advantage of those protests to, uh, you know, to do some looting. And we might think it happened spontaneous, but the guys that, the guys that stole the 15 Mercedes and took them to a chop shop already had their business up and running prior to uh, stealing those cars. And actually anarchists who are taking advantage to want to do things with the country. Uh, who would have ever thought just a few months ago that we would be in that kind of situation? I know Michael didn't think he was going to be away from his family this long back when he first came here. and. Uh, and then if we look at the situation as a church before that time, uh, we were, are you hearing me? Because I'm not, I'm not hearing, it's okay if I don't hear me, but uh, as a church, we're not as strong as perhaps we would have liked to have been and would like to be in terms of having an impact because, you know, regardless of all this stuff, God's working his plan. He's working his plan. It doesn't stop. There been, there's been stuff since... The garden and God's working his plan. But we might think, have there been times in the past when there have been situations that are as chaotic as what we experience now where the church has really made it? Well, the church started in the middle of the Roman Empire. And I can tell you the Roman Empire was not looking for a new God and they weren't looking for a savior. Thessalonica was one of the cities in the Roman Empire. I understand historically they resisted the Romans for quite a while, but around 200 B.C., uh, the Romans took the city of Thessalonica and uh, eventually made it the capital of the province of Macedon. That was one of the places Paul obviously wrote to, but he wrote to them because he traveled there to minister. The Thessalonians worshipped Egyptian gods, Greek gods, and Roman gods. On top of that, they had benefactors that helped, I guess, to build their city that they kind of venerated, so there was a kind of worship there. And in addition to that, uh, there were Jewish people there that held the very strict Old Testament Jewish things. And in the midst of that, Paul and his team 
go to Thessalonica and they minister. And there are two scriptures in the first, uh, in the first letter to the Thessalonians that, uh, that really struck a chord with me when I read them. In 1 Thessalonians 1, 5, Paul says this, because our gospel came to you not simply with words, but also with power, with the Holy Spirit and deep conviction. You know how we lived among you for your sake. And the, the three words that are there that talk about how the gospel came. Uh, he, he says, first of all, it came with power. Now, we might automatically think that the gospel coming with power means that there were miracles that happened. And I have no doubt that there were. But in looking at the passage in Acts, we see no indication of miracles as we think of them. And as I've perused First and Second Thessalonians, I don't see Paul talking about that. Now, they may well have happened because everywhere Paul went, there were miracles. But he was, I believe, trying to communicate that the gospel came with power, perhaps in a way other than that, so that we wouldn't automatically think that. And then he says, it came in the Holy Spirit. Well, people don't get saved without the Holy Spirit. Jesus said that no one comes to the Father unless he's drawn. Only the Holy Spirit can draw some. We might be able to make intellectual assent that we believe the gospel is true, but to genuinely be born again, it takes the Spirit of God bringing conviction in the depth of our being, and then obviously the whole conversion process will talk for a second about that a little bit later. The whole uh, conversion process uh, involves the Holy Spirit. And then it says that it came with conviction. And one of the old time Bible scholars, Adam Clark said that when Paul said that the, that the gospel came with conviction, it means that when it came, that people understood and received it as the truth of God. So that when they heard it, it wasn't like, oh, it's a, you know, that's great for you, or that's a bunch of goobly goop, and we're living in a modern society. When they heard it, they were convinced that what Paul and his team had to share was the Word of God. And we see in chapter 2 of 1 Thessalonians, he says this to them, and we also thank God continually because when you received the Word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted society. And as a church, quite frankly, in our culture, we're being looked at as more and more in the fringes, especially as we take strong stands on life, as we take strong stands on biblical definitions of marriage and on what morality is. And, and, and we need to do that. We need to take those strong stands. I, I'm reading a book right now, and the author of the book says in there that, that when pastors back off from preaching everything the Word of God has to say so they don't lose people, that it's a form of idolatry, it's covetousness, I'm idolizing the size of my congregation. Uh, we, we need to preach the whole thing. But when we preach it, don't we want it to have an impact? And so the question is, what do we need to do in order to have the kind of power resting upon us so that people are literally converted? Now, we know around the world the gospel's having an impact, and we know the gospel's having an impact here. But to really see an incredible impact take place, I think it's what we want. First of all, we need to fully commit our lives to Jesus Christ. And I mean across the board. When Adam and Eve were placed in the garden, God said, I want you to be fruitful and multiply, subdue the earth. Basically what he was saying is, I want you to take my kingdom throughout the earth. Now he could have made the whole earth a garden. But he made one garden and he said to Adam and Eve, I want the garden to spread all over the world. I don't know what that garden would have looked like in the Himalayas and all those places, but, but that's what God wanted. And then of course there was the fall and things got messed up as we look around the world and look at history and we see those kind of things. But when Jesus redeemed us, when we became a child of God, that commission was given back to us. 
go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, uh, to, to every nation, meaning the ethnic groups of the world, the 17,000 plus ethnic groups that exist in our world today. Now, when we come to Jesus, there's a lot of benefits. We get to know God. I mean, that's pretty awesome. Sometimes people get so pumped up and proud that they know somebody who's famous. Well, there's nobody more famous than God. And, and we get to know him. We get to observe what he's like. We get to understand his character, not just from a factual information, but we actually get to know him. And he continually makes us more like Jesus. Those are great benefits, but we are not living the fullness of the Christian life if we are not also determining by the power of God to understand what is our purpose. The, the, the church in general has a big purpose to preach the gospel to every nation in the world, and we're all part of it. Every denomination and every congregation has a part that God wants them to play in that. That's why he raised them up. And every one of us as individuals, we have a piece of that puzzle. There's a part that he wants us to play, and we will never be completely who we were created to be until we discover that and begin to walk that out. And by the way, the books and manuals and that kind of thing that we write are all designed to do that. I've got some back there. I've got a copy of our uh, Breaking Free book in Urdu, the language of Pakistan. And I've got one in Anyi. Michael, are you familiar with the Anyi people in Cote d'Ivoire? Uh, my friend translated the New Testament into Anyi, and he translated our Breaking Free into Anyi as well. And uh, so there's a copy of that, but there's some other books back there that you may be interested in, but all of them designed to help us discover who it is that God made us to be. Now, that's not necessarily easy because we live in a culture that the focus is on me. But if we really love God, we're going to want to do what he wants us to do. And if we really love people, we're going to want to give them the solution to the problem. I mean, what kind of person would you be if you had the answer to solving COVID and you said, nah, I'm going to keep it to myself? You wouldn't get sick, but you might get killed if somebody found out. But, but what kind of person would we be if we did that? And so uh, we're going to need to do that through difficulty. That's one reason why I wrote Finishing Strong, because how do we keep on pace with God even when we go through suffering? If we begin to become effective for God, I can guarantee you that there are going to be people who are opposed to the gospel who are going to resist, and obviously the devil is going to resist us. But it seems to me as I look at Scripture and as I hear otherwise, it's people who are able to keep going through difficulty that seem to have the biggest impact. You look, at the, you look at the book of Acts in chapter 2 and chapter 3. Peter preaches that first sermon. 3,000 people are converted. The Lord's adding that are numbered daily, such as should be saved. They go to the temple at the time of prayer, and there's a guy there that's lame, and they heal him, and they get to preach the gospel, and thousands more come to Christ. And then it happened. The temple guards come and say, haul them in and say, you shouldn't preach anymore. The believers who are hearing that, I believe the text indicates are kind of fearful because they're thinking, well, we're going to get hauled in too. So instead of, uh, you know, um, what's the sheltering in place as far as the gospel is concerned, they prayed. And when they prayed, the house where they were was shaken and the whole church went out and preached boldly temple guards made a big mistake. <laughs> and then you have the whole Ananias and Sapphira thing in chapter 5, where this couple sold a piece of land, and uh, they gave maybe 80% of what it was worth, but they said that that's how much they sold the land for, indicating we're giving it all. It was okay for them to give 80%, but it wasn't okay to lie, to make them look like Barnabas, who gave, who gave all of it. And Ananias and Sapphira, they drop dead. Sometimes we want God to bring revival. Well, when revival comes, walk in holiness because the 
stuff that can happen. You know, God can't let it happen. And we're told in, in Acts 5, this is amazing. I think it's two verses right together. It tells us that people were afraid to become part of them. I mean, you know, it's told a little white lie and they're dead. We want to become part of that. And the next verse tells us that they were continually adding more number. The gospel was irresistible. It was irresistible. And then uh, in, in chapter 6, we have the whole Stephen thing. There was some kind of conflict going on, and some of the widows didn't feel like they were being treated as well. I don't know if that was going on or not. But the apostles assigned some men to take care of that so that there was no favoritism being done whatsoever. Well, one of those, Stephen, uh, he wasn't just, you know, he doesn't just pack in bags. You know, he was praying for people and seeing family relationships healed and miracles happen, and he was giving all kind of wisdom, and they didn't like it. And so they hauled, hauled him in, and he preaches this powerful sermon. In fact, that's probably the longest sermon in the book of Acts. And he, he just, the way he ends it, you stiff-necked people, you. There's some pastors that would like to have the guts to preach a sermon like that sometimes, especially on Monday mornings, you know. But, uh, and, and they stoned him to death. Everybody but the apostles scattered. Difficulty. And you'd think they would be petrified, but they went out and they preached wherever they went. And then we find this guy, Saul of Tarsus, who was at, when Stephen was martyred, He's going to Damascus and he's got Damascus and he's got letters to haul Christians in. Paul gets converted on the way. And uh, uh, incredible things happen. And then the whole Gentile th- Paul's converted, the whole Gentile opens up in chapters 10 and 11 with, with uh, Peter. And in the beginning of chapter 12, Peter's thrown in prison. James has been beheaded already, and Herod was planning on doing the same thing to him, and God miraculously enables him to escape. And then, and then we come across Paul. Paul, uh, Paul kind of hung in there through some difficult stuff. Listen to this from 1 Corinthians. He says, Are they servants of Christ? I'm out of my mind to talk like this. I am more, I have worked much harder, been in prison more frequently, been flogged more severely, and been exposed to death again and again. Five times from the Jews, the 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I have been constantly on the move. I have been in danger from rivers, danger from bandits, in danger from our countrymen, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, in danger from false brothers. I have labored and toiled and have often gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst and have often gone without food. I have been cold and naked. Besides everything else, I face the daily pressure of my concerns for the churches. Do you ever get amazed when you read through the book of Acts and think, how did that guy keep going? I mean, the Energizer Bunny would not outlast Paul. He kept getting up. And Thessalonica was one of those places. He had just come from Philippi, where they cast a demon out of a fortune teller. And there were some businessmen that were really ticked because they had no, they weren't going to make money off her anymore. They threw them into prison, so they're, they're stuck in prison, and they planted a church because of a late-night worship service. He kept going. And so when they left Philippi, they came to Thessalonica, where all these different gods were being uh, worshipped, where there would be opposition from the Jewish people, and they planted a church. So if we're going to serve the Lord, we're going to go through difficulty. And if we make it through difficulty by the grace of God, we're going to see things happen. There's a, a uh, Romanian pastor, I'm sure he's with Jesus now, uh, Joseph Son, and he faced persecution. Uh, if you know much about Romania, it was not part of the USSR but they were communists, and I think the guy that was a the leader there may have been worse than the, uh, the, uh, 
Russian guys, and he said this, when you suffer, don't ask why. Ask him, what kingdom work do you want me to do? It's a matter of perspective. Why is this happening, Lord? Well, maybe it's happening because he wants you to do something. And then uh, David Platt, this book, uh, Radical. Any, any of you read Radical? Okay, I need to see about 50 more hands next time I come on Radical. Uh, some of you may get angry at it at first, but just keep reading because you'll see it's true. He tells about these two uh, really young Christian guys in China. Shan and Ling. They were teenage men, and they were commissioned to take the gospel where there was no church. And Ling said, I've told my family that I will likely never come back home. I am going to hard places to make the gospel known, and it's possible that I will lose my life in the process. And then his friend added, But our families understand. Our moms and dads have been in prison for their faith, and they have taught us that Jesus is worth all of our devotion. Don't know what happened to those guys. But it's that kind of commitment that gets the job done. And so the question is, do we want to have that kind of commitment? Do we want to have push, things pushed through? Are we going to be willing to be committed to the Lord and His purposes if things go sideways in our country. We have really had it good here in the U.S. We, we really have in terms of the church and the freedoms that we have. What if those freedoms begin to be taken away? What if they want to begin to take our children from us because we're teaching them heretical things like what a nuclear family is and that we should... Uh, that we should be opposed to abortion because that's teaching hate. There are some out there that would like to do that today. I think you're aware of that. But what if politically things turn sideways? What if we can't meet like this? Are we going to go underground and have our secret meetings? We're praying for revival. We're believing a revival is going to come. I believe China's in revival. But it's cost them a lot. But estimates are that there are about 130 million committed Christians in China today, and by 2030, they're looking at between 230 and 250 million. It is probably the most Christian nation in the world in the midst of horrible communism and oppression that goes on in there. But those that were committed continued to do so. Are we going to be willing to do that? And then, uh, secondly, I already talked about that one. Uh, we must be filled with the power of the Spirit and walk in the Spirit. Now, you may say, well, John, why didn't you mention that one first? And the reason that I didn't mention it first is because it's people who are fully committed to Jesus who have the Holy Spirit resting upon them who make a difference. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul says that Jesus appeared at one time to 500 people. How many people were in the upper room? 120. Now for those of you that aren't like Brian and I and like math, just check out here. That is less than one out of four. Less than one out of four of the people who saw the resurrected Jesus showed up for the prayer meeting. Where the promise was, you're going to be endued with power. And it was those 120, not the 500, who were baptized in the Spirit and changed the world. So that's why I didn't mention that one first, because I think it comes afterwards. That, that, that we do that. And so, uh, as far as ministry of the Holy Spirit, first thing we've got to do is get saved. Paul says that if you don't have the Spirit, you're none of His. When we're born again, if we're genuinely born again, not a mental ascent, genuinely born again, the Spirit of God comes and lives inside of us, and we're alive. 
We were alive before, soul and body, but when the Spirit of God comes into us, we're alive, spirit, soul, and body, and we're reconnected to God. And we need to be baptized in the Spirit. We need the Spirit of God to come upon us for power, for life, and ministry. Now, both of those can happen at one time. If I happen to lead someone to Christ, I kind of, you know, pray, for, well, I should deal with that one right now. Why wait five years? It doesn't make any sense to wait. But then we need to learn to walk in the Spirit. Uh, one Bible commentator says it means to walk in step with the Spirit. To begin to learn how He thinks. To begin to hear His voice. And then do what He says. And it can be very simple things. I think it was the second time that we went. It was, it was the second time we went to Pakistan and we met Rosaline, who was with Carrie in that, in that particular photo. And we had, uh, I don't know if we met the British missionary the first time. Yeah, we did. We met him. He was at the one meeting. And, uh, but anyhow, this British missionary, Nigel, was there, and his ministry was mentoring Rosaline. And he called her up, found out what we were doing. We were doing our break and free ministry, and he said to her, you need to come. And she said, Nigel, I can't come because I'm sick. And he said, the devil made you sick. You need to come. So she hops on a bus. We found out just a few months ago she'd never made a trip in a bus by herself. She lives in a very dangerous part of Pakistan. Had to put the full burqa on to be able to go out and get on the bus, and she came. And when she got to the meeting, Carrie was teaching, and so she didn't come into the room. She sat outside, and uh, Carrie was teaching on forgiveness. She was able to hear. She was teaching on forgiveness. And usually when we minister overseas, we like to leave a session at the end where um, people can give testimonies. And Rosaline got up and shared her testimony. When she was a little girl, I think eight years old, seven years old, the Taliban killed her mother. And uh, during that meeting, when Carrie spoke on forgiveness, she forgave the men who killed her mother. And Carrie felt like she should go hug her. And she was sitting there thinking, but I can't go and hug her because I haven't hugged all the other women that went up and gave a testimony. And, and she couldn't shake it. And so she went and hugged her, and Rosaline just hung on to her. And, uh, and before we left, she said, I don't have a mother. Would you pray a mother's blessing over me? And so Carrie, I don't think she said much. She just cried. <laughs> And so they've really been back in contact with recently, and we found out the rest of the story. Rosaline came to the Lord. She was in a Christian family, you know, culturally, but she came to Christ when she was around 18 years old. But because of what happened to her mom, she just, the hugging thing, you know, just wasn't something she could do. And that broke something when Carrie went and did that, and she determined at that meeting that she wanted to give the rest of her life to helping people get free. She now, as a single woman, travels all over Pakistan giving seminars to help people get free. But if Nigel and Carrie, with what seemed like very simple things, had not been obedient to what the Spirit said for them to do, who knows where Rosaline would be today? So it can be very simple things. Now, the Spirit of God also gives us spiritual gifts, and we don't have time for that discussion here this morning. Thirdly, we need to pray powerfully. This is, uh, I just tell you the story. This is, this is in Pakistan. And uh, Carrie had just gotten done, we had a session on women and how women should be looked upon in Pakistan. Kind of an interesting topic there, huh? And uh, these guys are praying, they are repenting for their attitude toward women. Oh, it's just a powerful time. Uh, and often when Carrie speaks when we're overseas, that's when the powerful times come. No, God just comes in, and it was an amazing thing. But before the Holy Spirit came, Jesus told them to wait. And, and, and biblical waiting doesn't mean like waiting at a bus stop. Although anymore, if we're waiting at a bus stop, you know, we're flipping through the the phone or whatever, uh, talking to someone or whatever. It doesn't mean just, okay, I'm going to hang out, and God, when you want to do something, do it. They were seeking God 
for what he was planning on doing. And they prayed for a good part of 10 days. When Peter and John were hauled into prison and the church recognized it was a fearful situation for them, what did they do to get out of that? They prayed. When Peter was in prison facing execution, what did they do? They prayed. I don't know if it was faith-filled prayer because when Peter finally showed up at the door, they thought it was a ghost. Uh, they, they were thinking, well, God wouldn't really do that, would he? But he did. They prayed. Paul continually in his letters talks about, he kind of talks, tells us what he's going to uh, talk about in the letter because he he tells us his prayers at the beginning in Philippians chapter 1, Colossians chapter 1, Ephesians chapter 1, and Ephesians chapter 3. He telegraphs what it is that he wants to, to he's, what he wants to do by sharing with them what he's praying for them. And, and although the scriptures make very clear we're to pray about everything, we're not to be uptight, have anxiety about anything, but go to prayer with everything because our mind gets focused on Jesus. These were kingdom-focused prayers. His prayer in Philippians was, I don't want you just to get half done what God wants you to do. I want you to live the most excellent life possible. In Colossians, I want you to live a life worthy of the Lord. In Ephesians chapter 1, he reads, says to them, I want you to get a revelation of all it is that I've given you in Christ because I don't want you to miss out on any of it. And in Ephesians chapter 3, he, he pr tells them what happens when the church walks together in unity. There is an anointing that comes on a unified church. And it is after he gives this tremendous prayer on unity, he tells them, God is able to do immeasurably more than you think, think or imagine. It's out of a unified church. I mean, we may speak different languages. We may have different color with our skin. We may have a little bit different theology, but we have one Jesus and one purpose to go through the world. And when we begin to do that purpose together, Amen. Amen. tremendous things happen. God wants us to pray regular, passionate, kingdom-focused prayers. He wants us to pray for the unbelievers whose minds have been blinded by the enemy to keep them from... I mean, did you ever think when you first became a believer that everybody I share this with is going to come to Jesus? I mean, they'd be stupid not to. I still believe they're stupid not to. But I also understand that their mind has been blinded. It's been twisted. They think, they think we're the idiots. And we have the answer. He wants us to be praying for each other that we will fulfill every aspect of the will of God that he wants us to. He wants us to be praying for two or three unreached people groups. JoshuaProject.net tells us that there are still around 7,000 ethnic groups in the world that do not have, they either have never heard the gospel or they don't have a church strong enough in their particular ethnic group to be able to reach out and touch them. What would happen if every church around the world prayed for one of them? was open to having someone go in, but more likely the reality of it is is that close neighbors are going to go to those places, reach them. Uh, we were in Cote d'Ivoire last year. We're hoping to go back to Cote d'Ivoire next year. There are 36, I believe it is, unreached people groups in Cote d'Ivoire. I'm sure there are unreached people groups in Liberia that uh, you all could help Michael to send somebody out to, to reach them. He, he wants us to pray those kind of prayers. And there's a couple of quotes on prayer uh, I want to share you. Arthur Matthews wrote a book called Born for Battle. I don't know if any of you have read that. Carrie and I have read it. Uh, he said, the spiritual history of a mission or a church is written in its prayer life. Wesley Duell uh, was quite a prayer warrior. Uh, was still living in his 80s or 90s. I think he's probably with Jesus now. He'd, he'd be around 110 now, I think, if he, 
He said, there's nothing higher or holier in the Christian living and service. In prevailing prayer, you rise to your full potential as created in the image of God, as exalted to the heavenlies to share with Christ his intercessory throne. I don't have them with me, but I got some copies of that back in my office. It's it's a little cumbersome. They didn't write back in those days the way we write now. They they loaded the paragraphs full of stuff, but a tremendous book. And then um, uh, Andrew Murray, I almost said Arthur Murray, but he was the dance guy. Some of you are old enough to remember who Arthur Murray is, uh, but uh, Andrew Murray uh, was from South Africa, and he says, where we work more than we pray, The presence and power of God are not seen in our world as we wish. On one occasion, when the disciples weren't able to cast the demon out of someone when Jesus was away, at least in the King James Version, it says this kind comes out by fasting and prayer. So there may be times when God may call us to do some kind of fasting. And there's different levels and different kinds of fasting that we can be uh, in, involved in. And sometimes it's taken to that level. But uh, do we want to have the kind of anointing that is going to make a difference in a chaotic time? We need to commit our lives fully to Jesus, saying no matter what happens, I, I'm not backing off. We, we got this whole illustration of people who did that in Hebrews 11. And said many of them died without receiving the promise. But they knew the promise was coming. And we need to be filled with, baptized in the Spirit, whatever it is you want to call it. Get it. And then learn to walk in him. Learn his voice. Do what he says. Some of the stuff he asks us to do may seem to us to be small or ridiculous or whatever. But something as simple as telling a young woman that the devil made her sick and you get over here, got her there. And something as simple as a hug made an eternal difference in someone's life. He may even ask you to give someone a hug during COVID. And then we need to pray. And then we need to pray. So as we close, before I turn it back over to Pastor James, uh, I'm, I'm just going to ask that if it's your desire to commit everything to him for whatever he wants, I'm just going to ask you to stand. And I always tell people when I do this, I love honesty. So if you're not there yet, I'm okay with that. I'd rather have you sit than stand and not mean it. So it's okay. You don't, there, there, there needn't be any peer pressure. It's just you and God in this room. And I'm kind of peeking in. Uh, so if that's where you are, I'm just going to ask you to stand and I want to pray with you. Father, we don't know what that means. We really don't know what's going to be here tomorrow. In fact, you even told us in your word that we shouldn't brag about tomorrow. We don't know about it. So we don't know. But we are telling you that by your grace, we want to be faithful to you to the end. Uh, We want to do what uh, Matthew 24, 13 tells us when it talks about he who endures to the end. It means he who bears up under to the end. will be saved, not necessarily salvation, but just be saved from a situation. But then the next verse, the gospel of the kingdom will be preached to the ends of the earth. And so, Father, we can't do that on our own, but we're, we're making ourselves available. And now, Father, I pray in a fresh new way that your spirit would fall upon those who are standing, that you would anoint them, empower them, in ways like never before. May they know how to walk in you, listen to your voice, and then obey what it says. And Lord, I pray that for myself as well, 
And then for all of us, Lord, would you up our prayer life? Would you up our passion? Would you up our faith-filled prayers? Would you teach us what you want us to pray and how you want us to pray? And we thank you, Lord, for what you're going to do. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor John. I'm just thinking about those three things that you made a, a, an emphasis of, that, that we need to commit our life to Christ, we must be filled with the Spirit and walk with the Spirit, and we must pray powerfully. And I was thinking that maybe you felt like, check, 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 like I've done those things. And what I, what I hear the Spirit of the Lord saying is that there is more for each of those. It's, I almost picture like a dial, uh, and th there's some rock movie where you can turn it up to 11. I forget what it is. But I feel like the Lord is saying this, like turn, turn that dial up, turn your commitment to the Lord up, turn that desire to walk with the Spirit up, turn that desire to pray powerfully up. And I believe the Lord is going to bring increase to us in, in each of these three levels, each of these three areas, our commitment to the Lord, our desire to be filled and walk in the Spirit, and our, our powerful prayers. So I, let me just pray that for us before we close. Lord, thank you for the hearing of your word. Lord, thank you that there's an anointing on it, and we want to be good stewards of your word. God, I pray that you would increase our commitment to you, that no matter what comes, no matter what we face day to day, no matter what comes in the years ahead, that we are fully committed to you in each and every scenario. Lord, increase our ability to walk in the Spirit, and to hear what you're doing, and to obey your Spirit's prompting and leading Jesus. And I pray that you would increase our prayers. I pray that we'd be burdened. Lord, give us a daily burden to see your kingdom come in our midst wherever we go. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. Well, if you've been blessed by John and Carrie this morning, uh, there's an opportunity for you to give to them on your way out. Uh, one of our ushers will be out there with a basket, and you can put something in the basket. They have their books here. By the way, I have Fully Live in my office. I've read it. It's a fantastic book. I can't wait to read Finishing Strong. I hope I got the name right. Yes, so you can check out their ministry on the way out. And if you're online, you can also give for them directly. You can text uh, love offering, love-offering to that same number, 84321, and any amount, and you can give to them. All right, Hillside, have a wonderful week in the Lord. If you need prayer for anything, I'm happy to pray for you out on the porch. I love you, and I will see you soon.